What are your thoughts on television as a medium and television advertising and its power to build brands and businesses? You know, Anurag, firstly, I always start with a confession when I'm in a room with uh, people like Sam Balsara, but not just Sam Balsara, but, you know, I think there's more marketing and brand experience in this room. I'm not a pedigreed marketing person. I'm a, from a business background, right? And when I say that, I use that, you know, while I spent 10 years, 13 years in media, and now four years running a consumer company, I think I use that distance of not being a brand person to my advantage. And when I say that, what I mean is I try to bring a business lens to all of these media marketing kind of decisions and question the obvious and ask stupid questions, right? And, you know, that not convinced by what I'm told, but I need to see the data, right? So first, let me tell you, I'm not sold on TV. To me, it's just data that has to speak. And, you know, I was seeing the agenda. I think, Sam, you're going to talk about the power of big screen. You spoke about some of these things. I just want to put out what I see as TV have four powers, the four big T's that I see, which is the power of reach. By far, it's the largest reach medium. Again, Sam will tell you the numbers, but it's a medium that reaches 800 million people. I don't think you have another thing that does that. You have the power of video. Again, you know, advertising, you're trying to tell a story. And a video form is the best form to tell a story, right? A print, a static creative cannot, you know, think of right from the times of the Nirma girl and the little girl and the, you know, Cadbury's, et cetera. You can't tell a story without a video form. So the power of video. Third is the power of big screen. You know, telling a story on that small de device, if you're a brand manager, it's never going to convey things with impact, like telling a story on a big screen. And last, which is most important, which is where numbers come into play, is the power of efficiency. When I say power of efficiency, you just run the Excel, you run the you know, spot rate, you run the you know, audience, you run the RF on that, you run the measurement, which is third party independent measurement. So I think these big four Ps or big four powers is clearly loaded in front of television. Let me also ask you, Anuj, because uh, you have a large balance sheet and a large company to run. Um, how do you see the next three to six months in terms of overall consumer offtake? Then we'll come to the consumer de durables uh, business. So, you know, uh, I always try to differentiate the short term from the long term and the tactical from the strategic. I think we are in a tough market, which is not an easy economy. I think consumer sentiment has been difficult for a few quarters, and maybe the next two quarters will be the same. Right? Uh, but when you're in the brand business, you have to, therefore, not lose sight of the strategic thing. You have a relationship with the consumer. That relationship cannot be restricted to the point of time when they're purchasing. That relationship has to sustain. I can't call you up only when I have work from you. I have to talk to you even when I don't have work from you. And that's a relationship between us as a brand and the consumer. So I think the base level advertising, communication, brand messaging has to continue all through. That said, you know, you will vary the budgets a little bit. You will tactically alternate or, you know, what should I say, change your plans a little bit. Your sales conversion may be low, et cetera. So those are tactical changes that you make. But I don't think as a brand manager, brand owner, you know, running a consumer relationship, you should really change things because if you have a soft marketplace. Okay. Anuj, I'm sure all the wise entrepreneurs who run large companies believe in that. Let me give you an example. In COVID, a company called Amul uh, upped up its spends across mediums. And of course, a lion's share of that went to television. An opportunity where there is softening of markets, is this an opportunity to get better advertising deals, better TV advertising deals, and hence be able to get better market share? Absolutely. So, you know, I'm a born contrarian. And when I say that, you know, to this one, I would say, you don't talk when everybody's shouting, because you will not be heard. So you talk in a silent room, and everybody will listen to you. So I think I would completely agree, your brand, your communication, when it was not a crowded space, you know, when the inventory was going empty, COVID, et cetera, for a long-term brand relationship, and you're getting the best deals. So you're getting the best deals, lowest spot rates, no clutter of advertising, et cetera. Why would you miss that opportunity? You should do that, right? Uh, that goes back to the point I made that, you know, strategically, that's the best time to do it. Of course, tactically, you're not selling enough, so you may not mount a campaign, you may not have a specific, you know, sales pitch at that point of time, so you will, you know, manage your budgets. You do have uh, budgets to manage as a p &L manager, you have to look at the bottom line. But these are just rare windows of opportunity, you must take advantage of it. And Anuj, seasons and festivals in India are a huge part of the demand and offtake of all kinds of products.
especially in the consumer and durable industry, you have products for every season, so to say, broadly. Uh, how do you see the upcoming summer season? Whereas the fag end of Jan, winter is not yet gone, but maybe in 30 days it'll be gone. I'm sure you're preparing for the summer season. What are your thoughts uh, about the impending summer season? Are you going to invest a lot in IPL? Uh, give us a sense of broadly what you're thinking in terms of uh, how to leverage the environment and the uh, TV opportunities, TV advertising opportunities to help sell and build the brands. So, you know, I'll answer this from the lens of our view, right? Or our lens. Uh, we are a multi-category company. We do have seasonal products. We have heating products, which work well in uh, winter, and we have cooling products, which work well in summer, right? And just before this, when we were talking in the side room, Anurag comes from Delhi, and I think Sam asked him, you know, how's the weather, and is it bad? And Anurag said, it's cold. And I said, cold does not mean bad, because it sells more heaters for us, right? So we want peak cold. So lots of liquor. Yeah, yeah, I'm not in the liquor business, but I do want I don't drink, to do, but you yeah. know. I would rather you warm yourself with the heater than with something else. I agree it. with you. Uh, no, so I think, you know, we do want, uh, you know, good winters. We do want good summers. Summer is a very important season for us. Uh, two of our largest categories are the fans and uh, room coolers. So, you know, it is a key season for us. Uh, the planning for that starts much in advance. We have our campaigns, but campaigns around products. So we have specific products that launch at that period of time. And therefore, then the campaigns around that, and we have to make a noise at that point of time. And therefore, when we have to make a noise, we have to cover the media. That said, IPL, non-IPL is, to me, like I said, you know, it's Excel decision. And when I say it's an Excel decision, it takes the burden off our media planning or buying team from coming from the CEO says IPL Khridne. That distorts the decision making. So I think decision making needs to be done rationally on numbers, on Excel. Of course, we'll have a conversation with Sports 18 or whoever else is trying to pitch that star, sorry, I should mention star sports since uh, they are one of the sponsors. But those, you know, at that level, we are very, very hard-nosed on our decision-making. So. Okay. Now, Anuj, since last 10 to 14 years, you've been actively involved in decision-making in terms of media, brand building, uh, apart from overall being in charge of the business. Especially post-COVID, what has changed in your conversations with your own brand managers, with your agency partners, and the ecosystem that helps you build brands? So let me answer this slightly differently, okay? I think we are living in a very complex world. The world is becoming more and more complex if we look at it in terms of just not the economic and geopolitics around us, but in terms of the whole consumer marketplace, the competition, uh, the noise factor all around, you know, the things that are uh, cluttering us all around. And therefore also as a marketer of advertising, it's becoming more complex, this media buying, what do you buy, you're vying for attention, et cetera. And, uh, you know, let me throw another saying, that in a complex world, simplicity wins. And if you can, you know, learn to distance yourself from all of this complexity, you have so much data inputs coming at you and so many claims coming at you, you need to be able to shut your eyes and just go back to what I call the first principle. And that's the way I try to, you know, do my decision making, that when it's too complex, no, you're not gonna make any sensible decision, rational decision, it's gonna be very muddled. So go ask yourself a very basic, simple question, right? And the very simple, basic question is, and I'm caught now putting this in the context of as a marketer or advertiser, what are you trying to do? It's very two simple things. You are trying to get your message across, the right message to the right audience, and you are trying to buy the media in an efficient way as to where to get the message. So getting the message across is a creative call, right? What are you saying? How are you gonna say the content piece? Again, make that as simple. I use two brand examples, right? Very simple, uncluttered, you know what they stand for. One is Nike, just do it. And look at the campaign, so clean, it's Nike, it's just do it, everybody understands that. And they will take that across whichever form and manner they want to deliver. They don't have to say too much, right? And take the second example, should I take an Indian brand, Febby Call, you know, Majboot Jod. They've established that positioning so rock solid, so simple, and that reflects in every campaign that they do, every creative, the story can keep waving, but it's very simple what they want to say. Most brands try to say too much. They're so confused in their head, they're trying to say this touch point, that consumer is ye bikega, usko wo bulne. A bit digital paper. It is not so difficult. The consumer is a human. He needs a simple message. Figure out what your message is. Be very sharp on that, and then bring all the complexity of influencer lying here, lying here. But be very clear on your messaging. The second part is kaha bolna. You know, get your media right. The media part doesn't come from all this abstract creative thinking. It comes from hard nosed numbers. You know, show me the numbers. There's Infosys, uh, Narayan Murthy saying that in God we trust. The rest bring numbers to the table. So media is simply what's your job as media. 
you have a certain marketing budget as you know as a brand or as a company we have three brands Bajaj, Morphe Richards and Nirlep. Each of them have a defined budget as percent of sales. Now the job of the media buying and planning team is simply that's the money you have 100 bucks spend it in the most efficient way reach the maximum eyeballs take this message to as many people with impact and they have to work a lot more logically rather than be confused by all of this complexity around. So I'm coming back to a different way to answer your question that we are in an increasingly complex world that requires us not to confuse ourselves more but actually become simple. In a complex world, simplicity wins. Anuj, uh, we are in the era of connected TVs. Today, almost all the new purchases in a certain audience profile are connected TVs. What is your view on the era of connected TVs? Is it becoming a substantial addressable market as a medium to look at? How has it changed the way you interact with your consumers? So I'll build on what I'm saying, right? Uh, TV, which is, I'm saying, the non-connected general TV, remains by far the largest le reach number, you know, platform, right? Again, some of the other speakers will talk about it, but top of my head, 210 million, you know, TV households, 800 plus million viewers. If you break that down to, a, you know, you're not buying 200 million households, you're buying a channel or a service, right? If you take any of the leading GCs, they'll be in a particular week, I think, some 20 odd million, you know, uh, reach, et cetera, that they have. Uh, so that's what you're buying. That said, I think connected TV is a reality. While TV may be the largest reach, increasingly there are mutually exclusive audiences, including you know, people in this room who probably never switch on a conventional te television set. So you do have to reach them. Either they're on connected TV or on other platforms. So you can't ignore them. So while I said everything I said, bulk of our budgets will go on conventional TV. You do have to cover these guys, but that's what I call the top up. And therefore, we'll top that up, top that up. We do connected TV since the last few months which we do not in the past, et cetera. Uh, that said, the other challenge is measurement. For good or bad, TV has a third party independent measurement that may have a margin of error, but it's somewhat there, it gives you good trends. All of these other platforms, we don't have a measurement system that you can rely on. And if I'm paying money, I would want to- Third party aggregators are now uh, bringing all the data of connected TV on single platforms. Yeah. So I think it will right. be available in the near short term. But you do have to cover them in your plan. It's just, you know, I think the tipping point when that takes over from TV is far away. Yeah. There's a whole saying, it's a cliche, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. The festive season for consumer durables, I'm not talking of just your business or about your brands or your businesses, but when I talk to a lot of my friends in the consumer durables, across brands, Indian brands, MNC brands, some Chinese brands, it was no it didn't go as expected. And with the impending softening, with the inflation being what it is, uh, the cost of supply chain and materials going high, what do you see happening in the near short term? And as a business leader, what are you doing to be able to deal with it? That's a lot of questions packed into I think every day you're firefighting, every day you're dealing with different challenges. Uh, you never have the tailwinds, it's always against headwinds, but I think that's the job description, right? Uh, I do think festive period, you know, has been a tougher festive period. Post festive also you've seen a big uh, drop this year. Uh, that said, you know, again, like I said, I differentiate between the long term and short term, a strategic and tactical. I differentiate between the job of marketing and selling, right? Uh, my brand is not built in the festive period, my sales do happen in the festive period. Uh, the fact is for our category, consumer appliances, durables, you have a lot, lot of purchase that is concentrated at that point of time. So you cannot afford to not talk to the consumers at that point of time. You have to drive sales at that point of time. Uh, but that's not the time to build a brand. That is just a focused period of window for sales conversion, right? Uh, but I'll go back to what I said that, you know, you don't talk when everybody's shouting. You will not be heard. So that's the time everybody's shouting. You're not going to be heard. At best, we'll put out some campaigns, et cetera to drive the conversion and the trade and everybody needs that to happen. But if you're gonna build a brand, so more of the money is parked outside of that, but because we have to sell, you know, we have to uh, be there when the consumers are purchasing, we do you know, cover that too. And Anuj, in the last three years, direct to consumer, digital to consumer uh, has seen a lot of new brands, about 30,000 brands, uh, about 800 to 1,000 brands that have done really well. and. It, traditional businesses, big brands like yours, have also started to leverage the power of D2C. 
how's been your journey? When I say your, I mean your business and brand journey yeah. with respect to D2C. So I will tell you, you know, I think as Bajaj Electricals, we are one of the earlier movers on to uh, e-commerce online selling. Today, about 12 to 13 percent of our sales comes from online. That's a few hundred crores. And therefore, if you compare that to any of the pure D2C brands in our sector, while it's only 10, 12 percent of our sales, in absolute numbers, that's probably as big or bigger than any of the D2C brands. Uh, it remains a very, very high focus strategic, you know, uh, uh, channel for us. Uh, what's also special about the channel is it's a two-way channel. When I say two-way, that's a channel where you get direct and immediate you know, response, feedback, data on what, not just what consumers are buying or not buying, but also what they're saying in terms of reviews, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so your ability to engage with them and get feedback is much better there. So it is an important part. That said, scale in India will not uh, be achieved by D2C, which is what you referred to also initially. That's yeah. why only channel. Yes. That's why the retails, yeah. even D2C brands are now partnering with ex existing FMCG companies or consumer durables companies. Or, you know, Flip ITC just bought Yoga Bar, because if yeah. Yoga Bar wants to become big, it has to become mainstream, and mainstream is, you know, all channels. So I agree with you. My last question to you, Anuj, before we get one or two. Now, as a business leader, what are the three trends that you see becoming bigger in the near short term? I wouldn't say what are your predictions, but what are the three things that you can share with this audience that will help this audience? So, you know, just top of my head, I haven't thought this through. I think what I started with saying on complexity, the world will keep getting more and more complex. When I say complex, consumers will be spoiled for more choices. You know, reaching out to them will be tougher. Uh, competition will keep getting tougher. Business models will keep getting tougher. Complexity is a way of life that will just keep getting more and more, right? The answer to that is to actually not uh, do what everybody does. But focus on the basics. Yeah, focus on the basics and as it's simple truly as a VUCA world. We've yes. been using the word VUCA for but It's a 10x VUCA now, right? It's yeah. a M VUCA to power of X, etc. I think second aspect is, you know, uh, it's going to be tougher and tougher to make money. And when I say that, you know, you have this inflation, you have commodity, you have climate change, you have all kinds of challenges. So I think financial complexity, I don't want to use the word complexity again, but I just think it will become tougher and tougher to make money. I will talk about our company itself. You know, we got away with doing a lot of things or not doing a lot of things in the last 20 years. And, you know, if, to be honest, we are a slow company, in the, you know, if I say between the year 2000 to 2020. Today, if we are not changing fast enough, we would be dead. So, it, you know, it's going to be tougher and tougher to make money. It's going to be tougher and tougher to survive. So the need for not just agility and speed, but the need for frugality is going to be extremely high. And when I call out frugality, look at what's happening in the startup ecosystem. That whole cash burn, all of this stuff, at some point, truth is going to catch up with you. And you know, the best time to be frugal is not in tough times. The best time to be frugal is in good times, because that's when you lose control. So if you're making lots of money, and this is a legacy from Bajaj Auto, right? They are the most profitable two-wheeler company in the world. And they're absolutely frugal on every decision making. And that's not being penny pinching. That's just being ensuring sustainability. So you know, second trend really is going to be tougher and tougher to make money. You have to be that thing. Uh, third. I don't know if it's a trend, but it's the people part that I'll touch. You know, I think, uh, and this is probably a, what should I say, oxymoron. We are finding it tougher and tougher to get good talent of the type we want and to retain talent. Because I think, uh, sorry, I think a lot of youngsters in the room, you know, their aspirations are very high, which is good, but sometimes not mirrored or grounded in reality. And therefore, you see a lot of job churn every three years, four years. I don't think, at least maybe I'm, Old, I don't think that's how you build a long-term career, etc. So, which our ability to get and retain quality talent is becoming, you know, very difficult. On the flip side, I think the job market is going to keep shrinking. You know, for everybody to be employed in a good around job, this time, yes, tech guys were getting 600% raise yeah. last year. Today they're being laid off. So clearly, you know, there is a correction in the, uh, you know, hiring side. Yeah. So I think this third trend I put in the bucket of people you are going to have a fundamental misfit on fitting good people and all of them finding good jobs. And how do you solve for that, both as, as individual professionals and as companies, I think. Thank you, Anuj, for giving us very authentic and very direct answers.